Hello everyone and happy new year. It's been a while since we've been in the world of the VCO Esports Studio. We're back for 2023 and getting ready to continue our journey through the world of sim racing. We're coming off what was a very busy weekend here on the VCO Esports Twitch channel. Not just with round four of VCO LFM Flex Stream, but the first of our VCO Grand Slams this year, the iRacing Daytona 24 powered by VCO. It was an amazing race, an amazing weekend, and we're joined today by one of the winners from the LMB2 category in the iRacing Daytona 24. Elvis Rankin joins us live from the Apex Racing Team facility. Ape, uh, Elvis, how are you doing today? What's it like being in the Apex Racing Team facility in the aftermath of a great weekend? That's very, it's very nice. It's good to be here. Um... Yeah, I've been here for a couple of weeks and we really, really enjoyed it here. And after the 24 hours, it's been a little more quiet than you would expect. A lot of the guys are toning it down a little bit now and uh, we're really just starting to kick into high gear now with the season coming up. And uh, yeah, so some of us are starting on Bathurst, some of us are venturing into other things. And uh, yeah, so we're starting to really get our head uh, focused in. Let's go back in time though, Elvis, because a lot of people will know you from last year in particular, uh, coming second in the Skip Barber iRacing Formula Series and carrying that forward to the real world, winning the Skip Barber Racing Series. But your journey in a motorsport started very, very young, courtesy of your parents. Can you talk to mm -hmm. those that are watching about your very first time getting behind the wheel of a race car? Yeah, so for me, the first time I got behind a car, I was four and a half. But really, racing started for me when I was... My mom would say two hours old. Um, how I got into racing was just like um, when my grandpa was growing up, he was go-karting and he used to kart all the time. And then um, he really wanted my mom and my uncle to get into it. Um, but my grandma really did not like it, so they never did it. But um, my mom, when I was born, um, I had uh, about my second hour in life. Um, my grandpa asked my mom if she was going to let me kart and she kind of just said, we'll see. And then when I was about three, four, I found this thing in America. It was called Quarter Midgets. And um, yeah, it basically just helped kickstart my career. And I really, really enjoyed it. I've always loved cars, always loved driving. Um, so I started when I was four and a half years old. And uh, yeah, from that point, started in Quarter Midgets when I was about four till I was about, what was I, uh, nine, ten or so. That's when I really started to branch into the road course racing stuff. I did uh, something called Bandoleros um, out in Las Vegas in the winter, and I really, really enjoyed the road course stuff a lot more than the oval stuff, really. So I really just started branching into that path, and then sim racing for me really started taking off. So yeah, that's kind of how I got here now. Is I started when I was five, now I'm 15 now, so I'm 10 years in this. So. <laughs> It's quite a funny story, actually, about your time making that jump over from the quarter midgets over to the Bandoleros, of course, after winning the uh, USAC quarter midgets national championship. Uh, I did yes. read that uh, you mentioned to the person that was running the car that you had uh, done some laps in the sim before, and it didn't go over the best with the car owner. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people, when I was growing up, they didn't... I was kind of, like, on the start of, like, the sim racing genre and stuff. Like, a lot of people didn't really believe in it at the time, and... Really, it was since COVID that it really started taking off for a lot of people. But yeah, a lot of people just said, like, you know, what are, have you done this before? And they just said that this is this is bollocks. Um, you know, it's a video game. Come on, it's not like real life. But then once you do it more and more, and then you can see, like, when you get in the car and you actually prove it to them, then they're like, mm, okay, it's actually, actually kind of close. Let's go back as well to, I guess, I guess probably seven odd years ago now, when you also jumped into the sim racing world. A couple of years after okay. you'd gotten your first crack in the um, in the real world in some of those quarter midgets. Do you remember what your first sim rig was like? Because of course you're at the Apex Racing Team facility with some oh. world class rigs. I have no doubt that what you started with was very, very different to what we, uh, what you race with now today. I was very, very lucky. I have always been privileged. My mom has very much been a believer in like sim racing and stuff like that. So she was really the one that got me a rig and stuff. Um, yeah, I started on iRacing at, uh, I think it was seven years old. And I swear that I'm the only guy that's maybe like nowadays that's on the pro scene that has read the sporting code um, and done all the stuff that you're supposed to do, but you just never do. Um, but I started when I was seven years old. And... Um, yeah, really for me, for what rig I started on, is I was so small that I had to get a custom-built wood chassis. Um, but I started on I started on triples, uh, triple 27s. Um, I think I started on a Fanatic 2.5 club, club sport, so like a belt. 
um, at the time that was pretty high end. At the time, I would say that was kind of before the direct drive era that we see now taking off. So did that, and I think I was on Fnatic 2.5 or pedals, or some kind of Fnatic pedals. I know that, but that's where I really, really started. Um, yeah, I just kind of had to get something that I could actually fit in and I could actually handle. But um, yeah, that's kind of where I started with on the rig. Let's talk a little bit then about more competitive sim racing as well, because you joined the Apex Racing Team midway through 2021. Can you talk to us about that transition, you know, using the sim more as a tool, maybe for real world learning, and then actually starting to jump into this more competitive world? You had a lot of success in private leagues before you joined with the Apex Racing Team, so it's not to say that you haven't uh, been around the block here in the sim racing world. Yeah, I've been, in my opinion, I've been pro for about like two years now or so, but um. Really, last year for me is when I got to get back in the real car and I got to get into the Skip Barber stuff. And for me, I started using the sim again, like you said, as like a tool. Um, and I really just used it to just help going to the tracks and learning what I could basically do. Um, and it was super, super helpful for sure. Like I used it every single time. Um, and we went to the same tracks that we did in the real series as a virtual series. So it was actually very, very easy to pick things up. But... Yeah, like the only round, I just didn't use it that much the first round because I didn't know the car and I just wanted to go into it open-minded. But other than that, every single round after that, I used it for a long period of time. And every single round, I got more and more and more. So it really proved to me that like, okay, the more I do this, the better I felt like I was driving and the easier I felt like it was to pick things up. So it was super, super helpful. Super, super helpful, super, super close. It was very, very realistic getting into the real car. Let's talk about the experience as well of being able to first compete in that Skip Barber iRacing Formula Series. Of course, the main attraction to many was the drive in the real world. And uh, you did have to get the, the call from Alex Simpson, the Apex Racing Team Manager, saying, you should take a look at this, uh, Elvis. It looks quite fun for you. Uh, I did, yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure it was like he was the person that reached out to me and he was like, this looks like it has your name all over it. And I just seen the link and read the header. It was like half a million dollars in prize pool for Skip Barber. And I was like, that's pretty good. And I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to turn that down. If he wants me to do it, then I'll go and do it. I'm usually, when it comes to the sim racing stuff, usually if they want me to do stuff, then I'll go and do it. So he was kicking my foot in the door. He was like, go do it. So I was like, okay, I'll go do it. Um... But yeah, after that, it was a lot of people actually were messaging me with the link and stuff. A lot of people had seen it. I had gotten a few direct messages about like, hey, this looks like something that you should do. And I was like, yep, already signed up for it and I'm going to do it. So Alex was for sure definitely the person who um, believed in me the most in doing it. And he was the one that pushed me in there. And he's the reason I'm here today. I mean, without him, like I wouldn't be in this facility. I wouldn't be in this rig. Um, I wouldn't exactly where I am without him, uh, so it, oh, everything to him. I want to talk a little bit about stuff uh, outside of both the track uh, in the real and the virtual world. One thing that uh, your website calls out is that uh, you attribute much of your success to the gifts of celiac disease and dys <laughs> dyslexia. Can you talk a little yep. bit more about what that means to you uh, being a, a professional racer? Yeah, for sure. So for me, um, I have, uh, since I was born, I've had this thing called celiac disease, which basically means that I'm allergic to the gluten protein, so I cannot digest it. Um, so basically, like, just to help people understand what it means, it's like um, bread. Um, I'm trying to think what else is like gluten. So like most of the things that you would think of, but like bread's the main one. It's like wheat, basically. So like a bunch of products that they make, I just can't eat. Um, and then also what comes to celiac is it's gluten and dairy. So like milk, ice cream, uh, stuff like that, I just can't eat. Um, so it really, really helps me because of my whole life, I've basically had to just eat super, super, super healthy. Um, so I'm always have good energy. Um, what my teammates would probably say is too much energy, but I think that's complete bullshit. But anyways, um, <laughs> uh, and then s dyslexia, which is basically like I struggle with reading, writing, spelling. Um, so like when I go to type some setup change or something into Discord or something like that, I usually struggle sixfold. Um, I usually have to spell check. Spell check is my best friend by far. Um, but it does give me like an ability, I feel like, to be really, really good at other things. So like multitasking, I'm very, very good at multitasking, which is what people say, like you struggle at reading, writing, but you're good at like multitasking. Uh, I feel like I'm pretty decent with numbers, um, but it basically like just completely nukes me in areas where I feel like I don't use, I use often, but I don't need it for like racing and stuff like that for what I do for like a living. But like it helps me in the areas that what I do for racing and stuff like that. 
I think it's always interesting to hear about some of the challenges that the drivers face off the track as well. Let's focus in, though, on this past weekend. You've had a couple of uh, iRacing special event victories, albeit not in the top split over the last handful of years. Biggest sim race of the year, the iRacing Daytona 24 Hours, uh, in the race-winning defending car from last year, paired with Michele Costantini, Stanley Deslanders, and Owen Carl. And you put it on pole. But it was not an yeah. easy race by any means. What was that first hour like? For those that missed the race, there was plenty of drama with your teammate in the Apex Racing Academy car getting spun and you having to avoid and then losing a lot of ground to your race leaders. I've got to ask what was going through your mind after putting it on pole and now being on the back foot. Yeah, for sure. I mean, for me, like, um, I've always struggled with qualifying. So the fact that I was able to stick it on pole in what people would say is the biggest race of the year in the class, I was ecstatic over the moon. But I knew that we had a long race to manage. It's 24 hours. Anything can happen. So I just wanted to get the head down and get a nice, clean first stint. Um, and yeah, it was very, very stressful first stint because it was so bunched up. Like we had done IMSA races the whole week and it was never this bunched up, never this chaotic, basically. Um, but I just wanted to save fuel the first stint, trying to give us as much of an advantage as we could. Um, and then I knew it was going to be... Kind of once we started catching GT3s, everyone was going to want to make a mad dash to the front because you want to be the first car going into the GT traffic. It's just the easiest to manage. It's the best. Um, so yeah, there was a bit of an incident between our Apex Academy 198 and I think it was Calc Racing. Um, it was a car with the Spanish flag on it. That's all I remember. But um, they had a little tussle up in the hairpin and we got clipped in the rear a little bit so we had about 17 seconds of repairs or something like that and we were a little bit down on the straight line so we had to kind of play a little bit more of a first conservative bit of the race sit behind people so we could keep our top speed and not lose people too too much um but yeah we managed to keep the car pretty clean besides that for my first stint at least i was able to keep the car pretty clean and I just remember just wanting to carve through traffic as best as we could wait for things to space out and then once we got our damage fixed then we really started attacking like um, trying to go out the Williams car at the time, the 15, the Malay car. Um, and I was very, very happy in the final, I think it was stint and a half where our damage was fixed and we got out in second place and we were able to push up to them. I think we were able to close the gap from like eight seconds to three. And that put us in a good position to hand my car off to the teammates for basically the rest of the race because I didn't jump in until like five hours left. So I just got to sit there, sleep, do whatever I really wanted. So, how many hours of driving d during the race did you actually end up doing? Because you mentioned this at the end when we tried it to you on RaceBot TV as well. Uh, 66 hours of practice for this race alone, just in the LMP2 class. That does not spend uh, include the time that you spent in some of the other cars, also getting some experience around Daytona. Yeah, so I ended off at 66, um, and I went into the race with 60. So, I drove about six hours, so wasn't bad um and then yeah i did the 66 in total which was from like all the imsa ess and then all the offline stuff that we did um but yeah before that and basically like i started when did i start i think i started mid-december basically it was like a little before christmas that's when i believe i started but i started in the lmdh um because i think that's what we were originally thinking we were between the lm2 and the lmdh so I started in the LMDH and I did about 15 hours in that car. And then Alex wanted came in and he wanted us to switch to LMP2. So we switched to LMP2 and that's when I did the 66 hours. Um, I went up like 800 I rating or something from the IMSAs and stuff. I was absolutely on rails. I felt like, I felt like for sure that was the first time in sim racing or at least one of uh, that I could say that I was like the top guy for the whole the whole week or the whole big event like i was the dude that was the quickest and had the most pace and performed the best so i was very very proud of that and i for sure think the time paid off very very well usually you're based over in indianapolis of course like you mentioned at the start you've flown over and been at the apex racing team facility for a couple of weeks getting ready for this what's the environment like having teammates, strategists, and, and engineers around uh, behind you for 24 hours, and I'm sure the luxury of still being able to go and get some sleep. It must have been very different to what you've experienced uh, in the iRacing special events racing from home. It was a lot different for me, for sure. Like, um, It's been a long time for the first fact that I have done a 24-hour race. Like Before the race a week ago, basically, or a couple of days ago, uh, I haven't done a 24-hour race since 2020. No, 2021? Yeah, no, 2021 was the last time I did a 24-hour race, which was the 24 hours of Daytona. And that was the first ever time I was in a top split special event like that. 
Um, so it was a lot different for me. But then also what's a lot different is, is like, um, usually when I'm in America, like I get the, basically for people over here, like the graveyard stuff, um, because instead of like it being four or five in the morning for them, it's like midnight for me. So it's, it's good. But um, somehow they still find a way to get me in the car, keep me in the car until 3 a.m. when I do it in America. But over here, I had literally just the absolutely just perfect uh, time schedule. Like I started the car, was like from 12 to 2, and then I had to wake up at like maybe a little early, like 4.35, but I had to get in the car at like 6 o'clock. So it wasn't bad whatsoever, and I had like a long time off. So I was super, super happy with that. And I got to bring the car across the line as well, which I was very, very happy of because I felt like I put in all the time and I just wanted to be the one to bring the car over the line, which I was super, super happy I got to do. Must have also been a little bit different when you weren't in the car because you would have been able to still follow the race, but this time sitting alongside with people, uh, chatting as well. Uh, how do you uh, pass the time during these long 24-hour races, especially like because you mentioned you did six hours of driving, most of it just at the start and the very ends of the race? Yeah, so for me, let's see, what did I do this race? So, but a lot of the difference was as well being here and what I did is, is like usually when you do like a special event or something and you're, you're spending almost the full 24 hours in the rig besides when you're sleeping or eating or stretching or something like that when you're just taking a break. Um, this, I only spent about the six hours in the rig. Like most of the time I was just sitting next to my boy George Simmons, just next to the strategy desk and just taking it easy, I could still watch the race, I could still be involved, but I just wasn't in my rig and I didn't feel like I was locked to it like in the other races. So I was very, very good. Um, other things really, was it just interacting with teammates outside? So we just made a lot of jokes and stuff like that. That's how we really passed the time. Um, yeah, but other than that, it was just like a normal 24-hour race. We just sat there and watched the race and when it was time to get in the car, we got in the car and uh, did the job. I know that you can't really talk about the plans for 2023, but of course, you've jumped back into the real world, courtesy of the Skip Barber iRacing Formula Series. I think I got that series name correct. What are you hoping for, though, in this year? You got the chance to jump back in. You went out there. You made a statement by winning. I have no doubt that whatever is next for you, the goal is to be on top once again. Oh, for sure. I mean, that's always been my goal in the real world racing. And as usual, like I said in the Daytona broadcast, I have to keep a little bit of a tight lip. But uh, the only thing I can really say is, is I'm not just over here for sim racing. I'm maybe over here for a little something else. So there's your little hint. That's what I'm planning to do. But if not, um, courtesy of Skip Barber, um, they gave me a whole new next season of racing. So worst case scenario, you'll see me back in Skip Barber this year. One other thing that I think is coming up on the horizon is you're about to turn 16 years old, which means that you're going to be allowed uh, let loose on the streets of the U.S. Uh, you've got yeah. now, what, 10 plus years of being in race cars. Uh, what, do you, what would you want as your ideal first car to head out onto the roads? Oh, I mean, like, I'm like come on, Arjun, are we getting, like, are we talking unlimited budget here? Are we talking, like, streetcar budget? Um, you tell me. I think... Go on. You just tell me. What, what, what do you All want? Right, um... Uh, okay, so probably uh, I'll tell you what it might it will most likely be. Um, it will most likely be like a Mini Cooper, um, but of course, like I'm I'm a kid. Uh, if it's a Lamborghini, then bam, like I'm I'm happy as can be. If I'm 15 or 16, I'm driving a Lamborghini, but it's not gonna happen. So it will most likely be like a Mini Cooper. But man, if it was any budget, man, I'll take a Lamborghini or something like that, some nice car. Talk to Alex Simpson. Maybe he can help you out there. <laughs> Uh, in terms of the sim goals for 2023 as well, uh, you've just won the biggest sim race of the year, so you've started off pretty, uh, setting the bar pretty high for the rest of the year. But what else should we look forward to seeing you in, uh, especially over here in the world of VCO Esports and on RaceBot TV? What are you planning in the virtual world of racing? Um, that's a good question. Uh, probably like the only thing that's for sure on my calendar at the minute is, is the special events. That's the thing that this year I'm fully committing to. Um, I finally, just finally gotten I rating that I'm like, I can get it into top split easily with cars. So that's no longer an issue. So now I can get in cars in top split. So that would be mainly my focus this year. But generally I just go into the same year with the same mindset of whatever pops up, whatever event looks good, then I'll go and do it. Um, but 
the only thing that's mainly on my calendar this year is, is the special events and um, maybe going after that Grand Slam, um, trying to win the four events. That'd be pretty cool. I know we've talked about it a little bit. We've won the hardest one already, so we just have to finish out the year strong and uh, see what we can do. So I guess uh, next focus will be on the second VCO Grand Slam, the iRacing Sebring 12 hours in the middle of March. Thanks for jumping into the VCO Esports studio, Elvis, and for joining us from the Apex Racing Team facility. Congratulations on the win, and can't wait to learn more about what's in store for you in 2023. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me, and... Uh... It's going to wrap up our return to the world of the VCO Esports Studio. Don't forget, every couple of weeks, we'll be back here live on twitch.tv forward slash VCO Esports to journey through the world of sim racing. The iRacing Daytona 24 is in the books along with the round four of VCO LFM Flexstream. It's another opportunity for our team at VCO Esports to relax and enjoy the coverage this weekend of the Rolex 24. We'll see you next time for another journey with another fascinating guest from the world of sim racing. For Mike Yao behind the scenes, for myself, Arjuna Kenki, party. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time. For now, race on.